Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Mike Yes, I'm an alcoholic. <clears throat> it's good to be here tonight, and it's good to be sober. It's nice to be back at your group. Um, and Barry, thank you for inviting me to come here tonight. Uh, let me get some preliminary things out of the way. Uh, this is a sad note. I woke up with a cold this morning. Thank you. I wanted a little sympathy. And, uh, <clears throat> and I've been choking the rest of the day. And so uh, I would like to, well, it, j- just understand that if I don't give a good talk, it is not my fault at all. I, 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 it has nothing to do with it. I, uh, I've had a good day so far today, not that, not that anybody cares too much, but I have, and uh, it was an easy flight up here, and then I got to go to dinner with some of the guys in your, from your group, and met a person who was brand new to Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, a lot of times I meet newcomers in AA, but it's rare to meet somebody who's had no familiarity with Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'll tell you, it brought back a lot of memories for me, because as I will tell you in a few minutes, uh... I guess I'm going to tell you now, huh? Uh, I, um, I didn't like Alcoholics Anonymous, and I didn't fit in well here, and I didn't feel comfortable here. And then I ran into somebody else who was new to this group tonight, and I watched how nervous she was coming in, and again, it brought back memories to me. You know, sometimes when I hear AA speakers talk, they talk in past tense, like all of that is just behind them. But I'm going to tell you a couple things about me. A lot of the things I'll tell you about in terms of my defects of character or fears or just screw-ups are current, present-day deals, okay? I I, I talk about some characteristics that I believe are related to alcoholism, but I'm not real sure of that. Sometimes I think maybe it's just mental illness, and I'm I'm not sure if it has anything to do do with drinking or not. And you'll you'll recognize them as I speak. Um, I've been sober since May the 30th, 1980, so I've been sober a little over 27 years. And happy birthday, by the way, to those of you who took uh, cakes tonight. And I'd like to uh, welcome those of you who are really new here. You know, they asked for the hands in this meeting of the people in their first 30 days of sobriety, and there were a lot of you. But there was a man who used to speak in Southern California when I was new, and he would come into our meeting, and he would always get up and he'd say, they've asked for the hands of the people in their first 30 days of sobriety. Can I see the hands of the people in their last 30 days? And every time he would say it, it would put a chill in me. Because I'm the kind of person who eventually screws up any kind of a good deal I've got going on. And I knew he was always talking about me, and I don't even fool myself to this day. I know that the reality for me is this. Unless really and truly, unless it's not a fiction, unless a higher power of some type has removed my obsession to drink and use, I'm going to do it again. I believe that to be the truth for somebody like me. And I wasn't always sure of that, but I am tonight. I was so terrified when I was new that when they asked for people to identify, I would try to hide. You know what I mean? I was just, it was a terrible thing for me. I didn't want to stand up. I didn't want to say my voice, my name out loud. And then once I did, I would sit there and think about how I looked for the rest of the meeting. I would miss the whole rest of the meeting, wondering what people thought about me. I don't want to say that I'm self-centered, but uh, I am. And, uh, <laughs> you know, if one of you has to leave tonight, and even if it's a true medical emergency, maybe you're aorta ruptured or something. I, I will suspect it had something to do with me. I, 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 on the way home on the plane, I'll be wondering, what, I wonder if that was real. I mean, did he, did he really die or was it just a... <clears throat> Somehow I grew up with the idea that uh, I was somewhat special, and I don't mean special in a good way necessarily, but just special, and that if, if you're that sensitive and special, Everything is a little bit painful in life. Huh? I'll tell you real quickly about my drinking. I, uh, well, let me tell you about a couple of things. I've been sober, like I said, 27 years. Um, and I'll go down the list as, as things get worse now. And, and I'm a lawyer, okay? And that usually brings certain booze in Southern California. <laughs> and then when I add that I'm a prosecutor, it's like I'm hissed out of AA down there. I, <laughs> I was speaking at the Newport Club a while back, and and, a lot of them know me anyway, and I told them I'm a district attorney, and uh, uh, they they, they booed. I I felt more unsafe there than I do in prisons some nights. (laughs) 
This is the only organization I know that uh, y there's some shame with being with law enforcement. You know what I mean? <laughs> if somebody gets up and says they just got out of San Quentin, there's like a cheer, and everybody's, all right, well, welcome. Bye. <laughs> You say you're related at all to law for law enforcement. It's like, oh man, how can you do that to people? Well, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, I, you'll learn it wasn't always that way for me. I didn't become an attorney until I came into into AA, and I was the kind of person who was in trouble a lot. Uh, but going down the list, I'm an attorney, I'm a prosecutor, and then perhaps worse, in the last few years, I've joined Al-Anon. I mean, I, I just can't. Uh, <laughs> I hit new bottoms every week, it seems like. Yeah. <laughs> and that has been a godsend for me. I go to a men's Al-Anon, men's stag Al-Anon. You know, I don't like men's stag anything, but I, I, my sponsors seem to think it's good for me to participate in men-only groups. And, uh, and I go to that meeting down in Laguna Beach on Tuesday nights, and if you're ever down there and you want to, a lot of people from AA go to that one, and it's a great meeting. And uh, I don't want to say I've had problems with relationships, but... Uh, I saw some people in here tonight that I'm going to marry soon, it, it, uh, <laughs> if I ever meet them. And uh, I, I grew up in an alcoholic home. I, uh, I won't, for the sake of time, won't bore you to death, but I know what it's like to be the child of an alcoholic. I was born in upstate New York and in a, to an Italian family, and uh, uh, we've always been involved in the liquor business in one way or the other, if you know what I mean. Uh, when there was no legitimate liquor business, my family started in it and stayed in it. My father ran bars and nightclubs, and it was a glamorous, fun life for somebody like me. I don't think it had anything to do with me becoming alcoholic, but I'll tell you what it did do, was it set a lot of ideas in my mind about what a man ought to be, the way a person ought to behave, what was fun. You know, I have uncles named Dominic and Rocco and people like that who had no visible means of work, um, but they lived well. They lived in Florida part of the year, too. and. Uh, I grew up with these ideas. I love bars. We, we had dinner tonight just at Tony Roma's. And that back bar there with a the little light and all the bottles and all the stuff still bring back peaceful, warm feelings for somebody like me. You know, I didn't drink till I was 17 years old. And up until that time in my life, I had done reasonably well for having grown up in the kind of home that I grew up in. Bad alcoholism. My father's alcoholic. My mother was raised in an alcoholic home. My brother's alcoholic. I mean, we've got it through and through. And there was never any question about that there was a problem with drinking. The only question was, what's wrong with us? But we managed to do pretty well. And I'll tell you, I'm a bad drunk. I'm not one of those kind of people who started out drinking pretty well and then got worse. I started worse and stayed worse. And, um, and, and they were, you know, I'm the kind of guy that if you came to some kind of a, a get-together where there's alcohol and I'm there, you never had to ask has he been drinking? You know what I mean? It was, it was just it was obvious. I, I was seldom mildly intoxicated, and I truly was more or less insanely drunk. Alcohol had that effect on me, and I liked it. I've shared this, I think, up here before, but I've got three daughters who are grown now, and they've been pretty much, well, most of their lives, they've seen me sober. Um, although the other day my oldest was over at the house, and she was talking to a friend of mine who was from here from Oklahoma um, for an AA get-together, and they were talking, and, and he said something about, what was your dad like when he was drinking? And she said, you know, I don't remember a lot about it. And I said, you really don't? I came in the room, and she said, well, just that one night where you came at us with a knife. And, and I'll tell you, it's been 27 years, and I felt embarrassed, because I remember that night. I remember waking up in the ivy in front of my two-story Cape Cod home on a corner, had a white picket fence, a dog, uh, all, all the things that... At least Ozzie and Harriet wanted in life, and I had them. And, um, and I'm laying in the ivy with a butcher knife when the police get there that night. And I don't know where my family is, and I don't know why they're gone, and it's not till morning when they come over, when my dad brings them back over, saying they were scared to death of you last night. What were you doing? And what I was doing was trying to kill them. Um, I don't say there but for the grace of God go I, because you, as you're going to hear in my talk, I don't think God does bad things to people. Huh? I don't think God picks certain people and takes them out of misery necessarily, and I don't think God does bad things to people. But I do believe this, that there's a higher power in my life that has worked for me whenever I have needed the higher power and have been willing to ask. 
but I'm jumping a little bit ahead. I was a bad drunk. I heard, I heard Pat talk about some uh, being a, what were you, Pat, a crack baby or something? I, um, I, I, I'm old enough that um, back in my day when I was in Southern California, everything that you could get your hands on was a felony. Marijuana was a felony. Everything was a felony. And I know it's AA. Some meetings have, get bothered by the talks about drugs, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it anyway because I am insensitive to other people's wants and needs. <laughs> and I, and I, but I'll, I'll try to tie it into AA in just a second. Um, in California, when I was growing up, when I was 17, that same summer I started to drink they had something called Bennies, and they were the big, fat, white, double-scored tablets of speed that really worked, okay? They were the best value in narcotics history ever. <laughs> you paid one dollar, and you got ten. Uh, uh, a true value. And uh, <laughs> I'll tell you my first experience with that, I, and I try to tell it as I did last time I was up here with, in today's language, because as you can tell, I'm fairly hip and uh, really street-wise, and uh, <clears throat> I called my connection when I was 17. Now, they weren't known as connections then, it was just Bill, the big stupid guy from the high school that I knew, and uh, <laughs> I put in an order for a dollar's worth of bennies, and I honestly became convinced that afternoon that somehow the narcs had found out. Now, I'm not sure how, if they just have taps on everybody's phone or what, but I, I drove over, over to Bill's in my 56 Volkswagen to score, and uh, I had to make moves all the way over there to lose the police, to lose the tail. I mean, I, I turned off my lights, I hid in people's garages, and my car had pulled <clears throat> It took me 20 minutes to go about two miles, and I finally got over there, and he was terrified. He came running out of the dark. He said, I couldn't get you the bennies, but I got you something else. He said, you have $5, which is all I happened to have. And I gave him the $5, and he gave me this little tiny silver packet, aluminum foil packet. And he said, this is called methadrine. It'll do the same thing. Now, methadrine was just the grandfather of methamphetamine. And he ran before the FBI got us, and uh, <laughs> I sped away in my 56 Volkswagen which I point out can't be true, can it? You can't speed away in a 56 Volkswagen. I, <laughs> it's like driving a car from the Autopia. You just kind of <laughs> uh, at Disneyland. But it was good enough to elude the police that night. I'll tell you, I didn't get a... <laughs> and I found a construction site, and I opened it up, and I thought I was getting pills. And so when I found out it was just a powder, I didn't know what to do. Uh, he hadn't given me any instructions at all. And... Uh, <laughs> And it didn't look like it was worth $5 to me, for God's sake. So I put a little bit on my tongue, waited a minute and a half, two minutes, I think. Realized I'd been cheated and put it all in my mouth. My mother, out of her own terror about drinking, she's never had a drink yet. She's 86 and a half. She's still got this tall now, but um, she would wait up no matter what time we would get home, she, we'd have a curfew, and she would wait up. I'd come home beaten up. I'd come home with my car rolled. It didn't make any difference. She'd be there. And on this particular night, I got home a little bit early, if you know what I mean. I came in the door fast, and uh, <laughs> my dad was there, too, that night, and uh, um, I'd been one of those kind of sullen teenagers at the, at the end, and uh, I hadn't talked much to him. It was about to change that evening. I, <clears throat> I talked till they went to bed. And, and I discovered that night what I was going to discover for 5,000 times over the next 14 years. I don't know. And it was that feeling that any of you who have done speed know. I'm in my own room in a middle-class section of town, and I'm feeling evil. You know what I mean? I feel... I feel like a criminal, a big-time criminal. I'm creeping around my own bedroom, for Christ's sakes. I mean, nothing's going on. I had energy to burn. Um, I neat in my room. 
I, uh, and I would look outside a lot. I, it, was, I, I, it was fascinating to me how slow a night could go. And, uh, and it also worked like Ritalin does for people with ADD. And so for me, I, I read for the first time ever that I can remember. I read a newspaper. And this is a true story. I even read the legal notices. In the, I don't know if you ever... <laughs> chewed the inside of my mouth raw. Mm. And when they got up, I resumed the conversation. It was like, wow. <laughs> my memory of that summer is this. They never asked me anything ever again. <laughs> they didn't even look inquisitive when they looked at me. It was like... Don't start. Uh, but, um, and I look back on it, I don't understand how it ha My Volkswagen, we had, we had a little habit. We would drink Coors out of the bottles, and we would peel the labels off and stick them on the windows. You couldn't see out my side and back window anymore from the, from the labels, and the beer caps on the floor were, were everywhere. And I'm the kind of person who's likely to say something like, why do the police always stop me? Why do they pick on me, for Christ's sakes? It's... Uh, <laughs> But my parents, who were good people, never said a word to me about any of that, and I know why. They were dying at home. I had two little sisters, and my mom was trying to raise them, and my father's drinking was horrible by then. And I went on to do that for a long time. And here's the reason I bring up the speed stuff. When I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I had a warped idea about being an alcoholic. I, I took a pride in it, you know what I mean? If I'm in a bar and there's some pretty young lady, or even not so pretty after a while, and, um, and she said something to me like, you know, you drink too much. I would think, well, thank you, I, I appreciate it. I, I took it as a compliment of some kind. I was listening to country western songs then because, as, as you can see, I'm a cowboy, and uh, <laughs> I thought drinking hard and chasing and fighting and gambling and doing all the things that I did were, were, were the way a man ought to act. You know, I took a real pride in it until I came to AA. And, I, you know, when you come to AA, I don't want to blow it for you if you're new. But they tell you don't drink just one day at a time. Can you just not drink one day at a time? Well, it didn't take long to catch on. They were going to say that every day, huh? So I wasn't sure anymore. I wasn't sure if I was alcoholic. I mean, I drank badly. And, yes, I was drunk. And I drank in blackouts from the very first night I drank. I drank in horrible, violent blackouts. I was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I was a violent, mean, crazy drunk. I would change absolutely while drinking. But when I got here, I wasn't so sure that that really meant you're alcoholic. It just means you change when you drink. It, it, I didn't see anything too, too bad about that. And um, so I started thinking, well, maybe if I hadn't been so wired, I wouldn't have drank so much. And then I thought, if I hadn't had such bad hangovers, I wouldn't have had to take the pills. So maybe there's nothing wrong with me. I, I, I don't know. And it was a man named Clint Hodges speaking at our meeting one night. Casablanca meeting is my home group in Riverside, if you're ever in Riverside, California. And Clint said, our first step doesn't say we're alcoholic. It says we're powerless over alcohol. Ask yourself how well you drank when you did drink. And that, like, killed it for me. I drank badly. I'm a bad drunk. I'm sorry to tell you about my daughter. I was riding along one day with my middle daughter, and, uh, Deanna, and, she, and they don't talk about their drinking with me for reasons that are obvious to me. Um, but she forgot it was me, her dad, one day, and she goes, God, I got a bad hangover. <clears throat> and then she quickly realized it was me in the car. So she goes, but wait a minute, I'm not like you. And I said, oh, really? How's that? She goes, when I go out to drink, I choose to get drunk. Now, I don't know what she thought I was doing when I went out to drink. I, uh, <laughs> I never had a desire to have a drink and not have an effect. That was never a concern of mine. What I wanted, what I've wanted all my life in one form or another is to behave exactly how I want to behave and not pay any consequence for it. Not have anybody mad and to God forbid ever be denied anything I want. I cannot stand the thought that I can't have my way because I suffer from another little thing for me. I suffer from a belief that I know what the next thing is I need to be happy. And I suffer from it prior to coming to AA and in Alcoholics Anonymous. And it can take a lot of forms for me. It can be the next her. Huh? It can be the next job. It can just be, if you just ask me to do this or that, if I can just get some more attention. When I was new, my sponsor used to tell me, you know, that old saying, if you just treat me special, I'll be okay. 
and I understood exactly what that meant. But here's what finally happened to me. I went to my first AA meeting, and I'll quickly describe it. I walked into a participation meeting and felt as out of place there as I did anywhere, and especially probably more because I was sober. I was tense, and I was miserable, and I was afraid of people. And I sat along the wall with some other guys who were just as pissed off as I was, and thank God nobody spoke to me. But I had happened that night what often happens to me, and that's conflicting simultaneous kinds of emotions. The leader would pound his little gavel and then call on people, which terrified me. I mean, I was the kind of person who in class would take an F rather than give a two-minute talk, and I did that. I mean, I left college classes and took Fs after a whole semester. I could not get up and speak in public. Then I became a trial lawyer, so you know, go figure. It, um, but that night, the guy's calling on people to speak, and I'm terrified, so I'm pretending to be asleep during the periods between speakers. Or I'm pretending to drink coffee or look at my feet or anything not to get his attention and have him call on me. But at the same time, as soon as he didn't call on me, my feelings were hurt. You know what I mean? I was like, God damn it. And uh, by the end of the meeting, I hated the guy. Uh, um, and then they got up and they said the Lord's Prayer, and I was embarrassed and humiliated by men holding hands and praying. And I went home, and my then wife asked me, hopefully, she'd been going to al -Anon. she asked me, what do you think? What do you think for us? And I told her, it's terrible. I hate AA. I mean, it, and I made up my own version of the truth that evening again and made a deal with her that I wouldn't drink for 30 days if she would never mention Alcoholics Anonymous to me again. And I remember it was about 10 days I was out in the backyard and I was thinking, <clears throat> why do you always have to exaggerate to make a point for Christ's sakes? You could have said 10 days <laughs> a, 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 or, or two days. You're a man for God's sake. You don't have to prove to anybody what about your drinking. And you know, I went out what was going to be my last run and ended up on May the 30th, being gone out all night again like I, people like me do, and I have a hazy recollection of some lady saying to me, what's the matter with you? A question I've been asked a lot. You need some help. And I was in my car, and I took a black beauty, and I stopped at the store, and I got two tall cans of Coors, and I was as lonely as I've ever been. One of the symptoms I have about me, sober or drunk, is a loneliness that I cannot describe to anybody else. We talk about it to each other, and those of us who suffer from it know what it is, but sometimes it's like being alive behind a glass screen or a wall. I cannot break the sadness inside. I cannot be all right no matter what you do for me. Because here's my truth. I've had lots of good things happen in my life, but they don't ever fix me. You know what I mean? I, People talk a lot about gratitude, and you'll hear in a few minutes, I have a lot of reasons to be grateful, but I'm not a naturally grateful person. Here's what I am. I want something to happen or not to happen, and then that event takes place or doesn't. And instead of gratitude, I feel momentary relief, often followed by more anxiety about what to worry about next. Uh, that, that's a pleasant way to live. It, uh, it's like, okay, now what can I have? That's my natural state left to me without Alcoholics Anonymous. But I was drinking that morning, and I just got buzzed enough to go by that hospital where I went to my first meeting, and I hid one can of Coors in the hedges for a snack for later that day, and I checked myself into a, a three-week recovery program. And the first miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous happened to me that morning. I'd been there about a half an hour and realized I'd made a terrible, terrible decision. I'd overreacted. It was silly. Uh, I didn't like I didn't. I was leaving, so I was making my escape from the hospital. When all of a sudden, a man that I had worked with before, a man that had gotten me arrested, I thought, before, came around the corner. His name was Jim Harrell, Jimbo. Jimbo and I had been on our way to Las Vegas one night when crossing the desert, laughing, singing songs, drink. He was drinking gin or something. I'm drinking beer and eating whites. And it was a fun idea for a while. And then Jimbo thought, or got confused and thought I was one of his ex-wives. And... Uh, I pulled into a little town called Baker, California, and took him into the Bun Boy, a very nice establishment, to, uh, <laughs> to sober him up. And he was, a, he was about 300 pounds at the time, said he fell over a table, and I got arrested for DUI. The only satisfaction I got that night was him crawling down the street as I was being taken to the Barstow Jail, and they were taking my car away. But I told him, don't tell anybody. Do not tell my wife. Do not tell our boss. Don't tell a soul. And he told and I never, ever spoke to him again, ever. And he didn't live in Riverside. 
and I'd lost track of him. I knew he was a bad drunk. Jimbo was always a worse drunk than the rest of us. And that particular uh, morning, I'm making my escape, and there he is. And he comes around the corner, and he put his big, fat, hammy arm around me, and he turned me aside, and he said, uh, come on, you're going to be all right. He said, I've been sober for almost a year. It's going to be okay. And he walked me back in. Now, let me tell you what's so special about that to me. He told me later that he was on his motorcycle driving down the 91 freeway through Riverside when he had an urge to call my house to see if we were okay. We had not had contact. There were no cell phones then. He went to a payphone call to the house right after the hospital had called to tell my wife I was in there, and she told him. And he said it didn't sit well with him. He was worried about me, so he drove over there. Had he been a minute later, I would have made my escape. Huh? And probably had a really good life by now. And... Uh, <laughs> But I stayed in there, and you know what? I'm living proof you don't have to have a good attitude to stay sober and to have good things happen. Thank God. Because I was one of those crummy patients. I, I've explained to you before how petty I am. On Sunday nights, they would always have the health and institutions panel, the H&I panel, come in. And it would always irritate me for two reasons. One is they made us shut off the TV. And the other one was because it was always only one guy. And so I would explain to the other patients, that's not a panel. That, that's just one person. <laughs> and the other people would say things to me like, shut up. Um, <laughs> and, and we were in there the last Sunday night. I was going to be in there. I was getting out on a Tuesday, and the panel was up there blabbing like I'm doing, blah, blah, blah. And I was daydreaming like a lot of you were doing. And he said, um, you want to know what I found in Alcoholics Anonymous? And I thought, no, I, I don't want to know. <laughs> I knew what he'd say, right? What was he going to say? He found God, found friendship, maybe found a potluck somewhere, huh? Um, <laughs> I didn't need any of it. But he said it again. Do you want to know what I found here, which truly irritated me? And he said, I'm going to tell you. And I was thinking, then why did you ask us twice? You know, I mean, it was, I was focused on him. And he said, what I found is a higher degree of mental comfortableness. He said, I have peace of mind. And he talked for a few minutes about his life, and he said he was going to go home to a wife he wanted to be with. He was going to get up in the morning and make his lunch and take it to his work. He was a butcher. That he was going to have breakfast with his kids because he wanted to, and he was going to go to work and then come home to his family because he chose to do that. I can't stand being a member of anything that is forced on me. And he was talking in a calm way about his life. And he said, you know, I'm going to have supper with my family because I like being with them. And then I'm going to go to a meeting, and I'm going to smoke cigarettes and drink coffee and be with my AA friends, and I've never had it so good. And he stunned me. All my cool friends and I had nothing that he had. I've never had peace of mind left to myself. And I have struggled all my life alone to figure out what the answer is in order to have peace of mind. I had no idea it had anything to do with my alcoholism or my inability to run my own life. That night I went back to my room and I started to read the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, and I read it, read it today and I read it frequently, and it still talks to me the same language that that guy did about a peaceful, comfortable way for somebody with my kind of emotional makeup to live. And you know what? Most of the spiritual ideas that I've been taught here are nothing new. I mean, we were talking earlier about the need for recognition and attention and stuff. Most spiritual leaders of the old-time variety that stand out or have written a lot and talk about things about a destruction of ego. Bill Wilson wrote a lot about humility, huh? About humility. And humility, I think, from what I've read and understand, is being the right size. But you see, if you have a, a, an illusion that your size should be giant stature in the world, you can't be right size. No, I can't be right size, let me put it that way. And I'll give you some examples. You know, there are certain defects of character that are kind of cool defects, too. I mean, like, like being in prison stuff. Um, same way with this. You know, somebody gets up and says, you know, I really lose my temper sometimes at uh, or whatever. People go, oh, yeah. Uh, um, on the road, I honk and nearly kill people 20 times a day. Yeah, all right, do it again. And... Uh, but there's some other kind that are kind of embarrassing, aren't there? How about this one? I'm so petty that sometimes if you get attention, I feel jealous. 
I'm so petty that at work sometimes if somebody else gets recognition, I feel so bad I want to quit. Those are the kind of things I've suffered from in my life. And those are the kind of things that I realize are all about the fact that I don't understand who I really am. I got a sponsor right away when I got sober, and he just moved to Riverside from the Pacific Group. Clancy's his sponsor, and had I known any of those things, I would have never asked him to be my sponsor. Yeah. But he made me start taking actions better than the way I think and feel, and I mean a lot of them. He told me things like this. So you're not going to make any major changes your first year of sobriety. Now, I was going down the tubes financially. I wanted a divorce. I had all kinds of things going on. In fact, it was this bad for me. I would be at meetings, and they would say to us, listen, newcomer. And when anybody would ever say, listen, newcomer, I wasn't going to do whatever it was they were going to say, no matter what it was. But they would say, listen, newcomer, um, if you drink again, you're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your family. You're going to die. And I would sit there, and I some days would think to myself, those should be the promises. Uh, I, I, uh, <laughs> that's how warped my mind was about life. I, 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 honest to God, if I could have guaranteed it, I'd have drank that day. Like, ah. But I heard a guy get up one night, and he said, you know what? I know my luck. I won't die. I will just lose more and more and more and feel the pain. See, I know what pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization are. I have lived it in my life. I know what the desire to kill myself is. And I don't mean the kind where you just tell people for a little bit of reaction. I mean the kind when you're really alone and there doesn't seem to be any other way to get any relief from emotional pain, and none. And in case I forget and run out of time, I know this is a fact 27 years later. Chuck C., who was one of my favorite speakers, and I used to go listen to him a lot and even got to spend some time alone with him, talked a lot about things that made a big difference for me in the world. And usually I end my talk with this one, but I want to talk about it tonight. He, he always talked about the fact he had a picture of a man on his desk with a long beard, and it has a caption under the picture. And the caption is really from Mark Twain, and you hear different versions of it, but it goes something like this. I'm an old man who's had many problems, most of which have never happened. Huh? That has been my experience in life, especially in a sober life. Now, sometimes things do happen. And they always seem like a calamity to me. But I have the inability to recognize when God's working in my life. I have the absolute inability to recognize it's God's hand. And sometimes I'm, con I'm convinced that the thing that just happened is the worst thing that could have possibly happened. And I'll give you a quick example. At the end of my first year sober, I started looking for work because I was in trouble. Uh, I was in trouble with the IRS and with everybody else, and I was in a real mess financially. My Mercedes was gone. Uh, I was making tiny payments on my taxes. The properties I'd owned were all going back to different people that wanted their money back. They were so greedy. And uh, <laughs> I applied for big shot jobs, and I couldn't get any. But one job after three interviews came through, and it was a salesman job that I wanted, and they, I was supposed to go up to Glendale on a Monday morning and sign the papers. And on Thursday or Friday, my wife and kids and I went down to Doheny State Park, which is a park down at the beach in Orange County, to camp out and have a nice weekend. And on Monday morning, I drove up there, and when I got there, the vice president came out, and he goes, oh, my God, because we've been trying to reach you all weekend. There's a hiring freeze. There's no job. And it was my last answer. Some of you may know what that's like, when you've put everything on one deal to come through for you to make it okay, and it ended. And I remember driving back down the 405 and then the 5, and I was so angry at God. I'm thinking, all these people say, uh, trust God, turn your one your life over to the care of God. What kind of shit is this? He lets me think there's an answer, and then he slams my head in the door. And I got down to the beach, and uh, my wife had bought a cake, and it said congratulations on it. And there were balloons and, and flowers on the picnic table, and the kids are dancing around. And I got out, and I said, there's no job. And it was like all the air in our lives was sucked out. And a minute or two later, or maybe 30 minutes later, there's a roar of a motorcycle, and it's Jimbo coming down to mooch a free evening at my campsite. And um, we sat out there by the ocean, and he said over and over, God's still in charge. You just got to believe it. I didn't believe it. My God's like this. He doesn't make me really believe it. He seems to be satisfied if I just at some point try to believe it. Huh? Because here's what happened. I got a job a few weeks later being a probation officer. I want to tell you something. I told him the truth. I told him about my arrests. 
told them about my drug use. I told them about everything. And I got a call from the medical director of Orange County, and she said, um, what is this? And uh, I said, I'm alcoholic. And she said, what step are you working? And I told her, and she said, welcome. We like to have people like you here. But even that seemed like I was grateful for about 10 seconds. And then, <laughs> <laughs> then I got assigned to work in Fullerton. I thought I should be at Newport Beach with cool people. And uh, so I was going to quit. I called my sponsor, and he said, no, people like you are quitters. He said, uh, you're going to give them one year, and they don't care what you think anyway. You just show up down there and just thank God you've got a job. And I'm driving back and forth from Riverside, and I'm pissed off. I'm feeling sorry for myself. And there's a law school in the territory they gave me, and I would drive by it every day. And one day I stopped in to talk to them, and I told you I'm a lawyer. I started going to that school at night and on weekends, and I never put AA second. AA was always first. And three and a half years later, I graduated from law school, and that February I took the bar. And on May the 30th, 1986, on my sixth AA birthday, I got the results that I'd passed the bar in a year when only like 24% of the people passed the bar. Now, I'm not telling you how smart I am. I'm telling you what AA can do for somebody to just tell you to put one foot in front of the other and do the footwork. I have had an unbelievable career. I've been doing murder trials now for the last 15, 16 years, and I have seen how we hurt and kill each other in every way possible. We go to murder scenes where I, where I worked. It ended a few months ago, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But it was there that I formed my opinion about a higher power because well-meaning AA people seem to say over and over, and people in the world, we don't understand God's will, right? And we don't. I don't pretend to understand God's will. But I remember at a meeting one night when a guy's two-year-old son had died, people were saying to him, God's will, we just have to learn acceptance. And I'm thinking, I don't know. And when I looked at the dead people I saw and saw the way they were killed, I remember the nights I tried to kill people. And I thought, that doesn't have anything to do with God. That has nothing to do with God. I got crazy babies I sponsor. Uh, and I'll have to give you an idea of what, the, what they think about God's will. Uh, one of them one day um, was announced at a meeting that he'd gotten an eviction notice that day. And then he followed that up with, well, it must be God's will. He's trying to teach me a lesson. I explained to him later, it wasn't God's will. It was his landlord's will. I mean, for Christ's sakes. Uh, <laughs> I had another baby that bought a car. He called me one day. He said, I bought a car today. I go, well, where'd you get it? He said, the junkyard. I sponsor some very bright men, and uh, I said, does it run? He goes, I don't know. That's up to God. <laughs> and guess what? God didn't want it to run. <laughs> uh, I don't think God... Now, please, I'm not trying to tell anybody else how to believe. I could not turn my will and my life over to the care of God, who periodically, for instance, says, eh, not today. I want the battery dead. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I don't think God does bad things to me to teach me a lesson. Here's what I believe for me. The higher power does things for me and takes care of me no matter what when I rely on the higher power. And at the times that it's the darkest and I can't see a way out of my predicament, it always works out. And the reason I come to meetings is to get hope. Because I believe this. You tell me over and over, clean house and trust God. And to date, that has worked every time. But when a new thing happens, I cannot remember it by myself. I lost my job recently. A new DA came in, and it was time for me to have to leave. And I'll tell you, I knew I was attached to that job, and I liked it a lot. But the pain was horrible after a while. First, it wasn't too bad. Kind of nice. Went on a cruise, did some stuff. But I didn't realize how much I identified with that job. I'm running around playing cops and robbers and carrying a gun and doing all that was such an exciting thing for me. And it ended. And so I figured, okay, it's always worked before. The higher power just step in. I'll have some sign soon. It hasn't worked yet that I know of, but here's the deal tonight. I've been around long enough to know I don't have to throw in the towel. Huh? The other thing I don't, didn't tell you is I may never have to work again if I don't want to. When I came in here, I was so broke I have a retirement now that, uh, and I'm not telling you that in a bragging way either. It's like this. Chuck C. used to say a couple of things that were real important to me and still are. He would say, the measure of our anxiety is the measure of our distance from God. And I would think, oh my God, it must be quite a ways away then because I'm anxious. Uh, <laughs> and, um, but it would always bring me back to remembering this. Either God is or he isn't. Huh? 
what am I going to do? And he would say it like this. Either I'm going to run my own life and take the consequences thereof, or I'm not going to run it and take the consequences thereof. Now, there are things I can do to change my situation today. But here's the problem with somebody like me. When I'm at a meeting and people are saying, just do the footwork, just do the footwork, I go, yeah. And I get in my car and I don't know what the footwork is. Well, I don't have a clue what it is. Because I always believe that the result ought to be what it is I'm pushing for. And yet, by experience, that has not always been the case. Sometimes it is. You know, I have a good life today. I've had a wonderful week. I've been involved in AA for the last nine days at different functions, and i got another one tomorrow night. And, and my life is truly good. I don't have one want unless I stop and start to think. Uh, I'll finish up with this. There was a girl who came from the La Jolla Speakers meeting uh, not too long ago, spoke at my home group named Kim. And she had a line that I thought was great. She talked about some bad behavior she had done in sober. And I've done that, that kind of stuff, too. It's a shock, but I have. And uh, she said, you know, her sponsor told her what my sponsor told me. You can do anything you're willing to pick up the tab for, as long as you don't drink. But she said, you know what? We don't always know what that tab's going to be, do we? And that's a very true thing. I can take any action I want to take today. And the tab may be drinking again, maybe not. But there will be a tab if my behavior is not in line to what my conscience tells me. I pray every day. I talk to the guys I sponsor every day. I have a sponsor and talk to him, Cliff Roach, on a regular basis. I go where I'm asked to go and I do what I'm asked to do, not because I feel like I'm some kind of AA missionary or saint, but because I want to be happy, joyous, and free. Huh? I want to have what that little man had, the panel had. I want peace of mind. And tonight I have it. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.